Good evening, everyone. Um, I'd like to welcome you very warmly to St. Peter Mancroft. Um, we're delighted to have you here, um, and we're delighted to have Gaia here as well. One of the great joys of this whole process for me has been developing partnerships with different people, and um, I'm really enormously grateful for all of the help we've received from Science and Faith in Norfolk, um, particularly from Nick Bruin, um, who is the secretary, and uh, he has contributed so much behind the scenes to bringing Gaia here, so thank you very, very much indeed. Um, I am going to hand over to Doc Reverend Dr. Patrick Richmond to do the introductions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Fiona. Wonderful to be welcomed here. Wonderful to see people here for this talk. My name is Patrick Richmond. I'm the chair of Science and Faith in Norfolk. I've been wonderfully supported by Professor Nick Bruin. He told me in no way should I embarrass him. So I just thought I'd say what a key role he has in grant applications that really work. And you can see that that has helped finance this wonderful visual aid as we have this wonderful exhibition in St. Peter Mancroft and the theme of the climate crisis particularly with a globe illuminated. You've seen some of the Science and Faith in Norfolk pictures of the globe above the moon and I'm largely informed by Nick that if you go out, stand on the forum steps and look in, you see the earth rising somewhat as the astronauts on the moon saw that earth rise. And you also get a wonderful effect on the video that St. Peter Mancroft are taking of this talk. The globe suspended with the blue light is a sight to behold. And it's brilliant to be introducing our speaker tonight under this globe. We're very grateful to equipping Christian leadership in an age of science, a program from scientists in congregations they are the ones who provided the wonderful grant that my wonderful secretary was able to apply for so successfully. And as we meet under the globe, we're reminded of the various challenges that we face in this era, this era of climate change. It's, it's wonderful to be in a church and it's not too cold, isn't it? But of course, the climate is warming up. We have hurricanes and extreme weather events that are more frequent. We have a global population that is growing, more mouths to feed, and less agricultural land. And so we are faced with a challenge not unlike that of feeding 5,000 people in a wilderness in Israel. No pressure, Professor, as you come to talk to us about how we might do this. But I know that you are a most distinguished geneticist because my secretary has informed me of this. Professor Bell, Christabel Huawei has been researching on crop varieties to improve their yield. He has provided crop varieties for farmers in India, Ethiopia, Kenya, Brazil, Chile and Mexico, all of them rotating above us as I speak. Christabel uh, started his research career in Chile, where he was brought up a Roman Catholic. You can see just how big South America is. And then he moved to North America, to California. Beach life, probably, but, but much smaller, as you can see on the globe, before coming here in 2009 to the John Innes Center, where he's continued his internationally recognized research. As well as being internationally recognised, he's been recognised by our own Royal Agricultural Society, receiving their research medal. And he is actively training a new generation of crop scientists to do nothing less than feed the world. So please can we give a round of applause for Professor Christopher Huawei as he comes to speak to us tonight. Thank you for that very kind introduction. So today well, I'll try to tell you some of the challenges, uh, some of the things we're trying to do, but it's a complex problem, okay? And I, I'd like to start with this picture of Ethiopia because I think it highlights some of the challenges we face. It's, you know, we have a, a precipice right there. We have farmers that are still using traditional agriculture, traditional varieties, 
uh, and it's not like the farmers we normally see here in Norfolk with big tractors and so on, or Jeremy Clarkson, or we saw with his Lamborghini tractor, right? Most of agriculture is still done like that around the world, and it's very, very important. And, and one of the things that I think distinguishes what we try to do is that these are the UN Sustainable Development Goals, and I think agriculture has such an important role to play there because if you look at them, poverty, hunger, good health, you know, good health is all about what you eat. Quality education, many times uh, money that comes through agriculture goes to educating kids and so on. So a lot of this, the sustainable development goes, goes through agriculture, but sometimes agriculture, we forget about it because only 1% of people in the UK, for example, are directly involved in agriculture, although we all depend on agriculture every day. And I think over the last few months, we've seen how much, how dependent we are on agriculture when we actually see our shelves empty. We suddenly remember agriculture is so central to what we do. The other thing I wanted to say is that I think the objectives, our goals, are, 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 are mostly shared. Sometimes we have different ways of getting there, but the idea of to make more production, healthier production, more sustainable, and more affordable for people, I think that's the goal of most of the scientists that are working on this challenge. So a little bit just to put the backdrop, um, we talked about population growth, but when we look at population growth over the next you know, 100 years, the population will not grow equally all over the world. It will mostly be concentrated in Africa. So the 9 billion, 10 billion people will mostly be growth of people in Africa. Okay? We, have, we depend on relatively few crops as well. So if you start thinking what we eat every day, uh, we might have a varied diet, but around the world, you can see here that rice and wheat pretty much give you 40 to 50% of the calories that we have every day in the world. So that's a lot, and we depend just on a few crops. And something that also is, is, is a little bit concerning is that when you think about that, which countries produce, for example, maize, four countries or five countries are responsible for about 80% of that crop that's shared around the world, that's exported. And why is that important? Because we depend on those five countries, let's say, to produce most of the food. If anything happens in those countries, all of a sudden, we start feeling a pinch in another part of the world. So, in a way, this is kind of showing that we're all in this together. And this really documents how we've moved from a society that produced more locally, produced its food, had more connection with land, to a society where we have lots of money in London and we use that money to import food. And that's kind of where the world is now. This shows that two billion people, right, so a little bit about a third of the world, depends on food imports, right? And you can see here that this is the, the, the trade of agricultural products around the world. So it's a huge shipment. And you can see it also when you go to your local supermarkets. Most of the food comes from all parts of the world and the UK is actually very good at that. But at the same time, that poses risks. So we have seen this, this is an example of Egypt, of course, um, a few years back there was uh, a price increase because there were shortages of wheat from Russia, that Russia is one of the main exporters of wheat to Egypt. So although you don't see it here, Egypt is the biggest consumer of wheat, but it doesn't produce enough, so it imports from Russia. All of a sudden, Russia had droughts, not enough, and they closed, we're not going to export any wheat, and suddenly prices went through the roof and there was a shortage of wheat not just in Egypt, but in all of uh, Northern Mediterranean and other Arab countries, and that was what actually one of the triggers for the Arab Spring. And, and we kind of think about this like, okay, that's happening over there, you know, but you know, it's also happening here. We, we saw it this last few weeks. This is one of the, the great floods that we had in, um, in the US and North America two years ago. Um, huge irrigation right at the harvest time, so a lot of the grain that was just harvested swelled and it exploded literally just broke through the silos and all of that harvest was lost so huge amount of energy of wastage there just because of flooding and often because you know it's not a problem of just the floods because of how we manage our river so these are all complex problems but i think that the the, the critical thing about climate change is that we start having we're all aware of these um, let's say extreme events are going to happen right we have more precipitation or more drought a certain year but the, the, the worrying thing is that extreme events happening in two or more places at the same time 
usually were about a one in a hundred years, so a one in a hundred year event. So maybe every three generations there would be an event where really there was really shortages because there would be two dramatic events of drought or too much water in two of these big producing countries. Because of climate change, this probability is now about one in 30 and it's going to get to about one in 25 over the next few years. So that means that within our lifetime, we're going to have probably two or three occasions when there's going to be shortages and really damning shortages. And we can just see a little bit of this in our food shelves, right? So this is uh, just taken from three days ago, right? You can see three days ago. This is, uh, I won't say the brand, let's say Tesco, okay? And this is the pasta row, pasta aisle. And there's no pasta. And all of a sudden, people are saying, well, there should be pasta, right? But well, pasta has to grow somewhere. And the problem was that Canada had extremely dry weather. So Canada is one of the big producers of pasta, of, of flour for pasta. And then Europe and France had extremely dry weather. So you have a coinciding of these two events happening at the same time. And right now, there's actually a shortage of wheat in the world. And we're really depending on Argentina right now. That's the, that's the reality where we are right now. If Argentina has a bad weather event, we're going to have shortages of wheat, unlike we've seen over the last 15 years. We've never seen that shortage. So right now, stocks are being depleted. And if you think about you know, how many days of wheat, if we didn't produce any more wheat in the world, right? How many days of wheat do we have left, or how many months? We have 17 days of wheat left. China has a little bit more. China controls a little bit more. But around the world, we have about 17 days of wheat. So if we didn't harvest any more harvest combines of wheat, in 17 days, we run out of wheat. So, you know, it is really something that we can't say, you know, we'll be okay for several months. Actually, we won't be okay for several months. So, not to scare you, but you can see that on both sides of the Atlantic, we had issues, and right now, that's what's hitting here. Apart from all the other issues we have, there is a problem with wheat. So, climate change also brings some new challenges that we haven't faced. So, this is a beautiful image, but it's a devastating image at the same time. So this is a really big magnification of a leaf. And what's coming from it is rust, it's a, it's a pathogen, it's a fungi. And the fungi has grown inside the wheat plant and now it's exploding and coming out. And this fungi is something that we had under control for several years genetically, the plants were resistant. But now with the higher temperatures that we're seeing over the summers, new strains of the isolate have come that we hadn't seen before in the UK. And our varieties are not resistant just like we weren't resistant to COVID, we were not, in this case, they were not resistant to this. And now this pathogen can come in and start destroying our yield. So we have this ever running race with the pathogen trying to get varieties that are resistant. But with climate change, we see not just new strains of the pathogen, but also new diseases like we hadn't had before. And this is a challenge that we have to look ahead to. And we also have, in this case, that as more people, this is a picture from in, in Africa, actually, showing how more people are losing their traditional diet and moving more to cities. As we move to cities, normally we have less time. And when we have less time, we just go for the nice, easy to eat loaf of bread and we forget our traditions. And I think that's also another challenge that as we move forward, people need to remember agriculture and, and usually these very processed foods are not very nutrient rich. Actually, they have a lot of carbohydrates, but not actually not nutrient rich. Okay, so this kind of sets the scene of some of the challenges that we face going forward. So one of the other things that perhaps it's good to remind ourselves is that this, you know, we, all, we, we normally think about people that are undernourished and there's about 800 million people that are undernourished in the world. I think this number is a little bit better in terms of food insecure. This means people that will go hungry, go to bed hungry. And it's pretty damning, you know, it's 1.9 billion people are food insecure. And perhaps quite surprising, you can see that you know, we're there. We're about five, five million people will go food insecure in the UK. That means people are going hungry to bed tonight. And you will all have heard of Marcus Rashford, the football player from Manchester United, that's doing a big campaign because most of those 4.7 million people in the UK are kids. And I was quite shocked to learn that in a normal classroom of 30 kids, nine of them are food insecure in the UK at this moment. And that's not an issue of production, that's an issue of politics, which I won't get into, right? But you can just see that it's, it's very complicated, but nine out of 30 kids are food insecure in the UK. I come from Chile, right? Over there. And Chile, you know, it's, it's, it's starting to develop, 
but you would never imagine that. And it's quite shocking that as a society we haven't faced that. So the solutions will not all be technology, will not all be science, it'll also be politics and the politicians that we elect perhaps to think about this. But it's important to think about that, that nine out of 30 kids go to bed hungry in the UK, which is, which is really shocking. So when we think about producing more food, we project to the future and say, how much more food do we need to produce? And given the current trends of what we're doing now with the food, uh, which I'll speak a little bit in a, in a minute, currently our projections are these lines that are kind of these solid lines. And the dashed lines are what we need to produce to actually feed that 9 billion people by 2050. So we're really not going to get there based on how we're doing things at the moment. Okay? So, of course, I'm a geneticist, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about how we're looking at genetics at this, but I'm very happy to then have a, a, a wider discussion about some of the, the, the issues. Okay, so where will we find enough food, right, to, to feed the 10 billion people? So, one of the things I always start off with is saying that we need a more varied diet, okay? And, and that's something to, you know, people say you're shooting yourself in the foot because I work on wheat, so I should be saying people should eat lots of wheat. But actually, we eat lots of wheat already. We probably need a more varied diet. But actually making these traditional dishes, more seafood, more legumes, and so on, it's actually time consuming, it's quite difficult. Many people, many kids are not even taught how to cook anymore. And it becomes more complicated. And you can just go over the shelf, do your delivery, and get your food, it's prepared, it's super easy. But actually we, we need to start thinking about a more, a more varied diet. And, and fish is really one of those things that perhaps we, we really abandoned. Um, this just shows a little bit of, of, of food, of, sorry, of fishery consumption. So these are the, the, the number of fish. And you can see that over the last you know, 60 years, we've increased the amount of fish we eat. Most of it is caught, but now that's been going down because we're overfishing our seas as well, kind of we're depleting the seas as well. But you can see here that the rest of the world still has a long way to go in terms of, of, of fish. New crops as well. Does anyone know what this is? It's from Bolivia. It's also grown in the UK by a really nice company called the British Quinoa Company. So it's quinoa, okay? So it's one of these kind of new superfoods. But the idea is that there are, there are foods that have not been mainstreamed, let's say like wheat or rice and maize and, and soybean, for example, that are really healthy alternatives and we need to start looking at them, okay? And this has been a, a big boom. And I'll show you another one here. This is from Ethiopia. There's something called teff. And there's the main staple in Ethiopia. They make their bread out of teff, not out of wheat. That's a different source. So there's a huge diversity of crops, but we at the moment are basically getting all our calories from about five, let's say, I think it's six crops give us 90% of the calories, including potato and so on, right? So it's, it's actually quite limited, but we need to diversify. But for that, you also need to be, have systems that will allow food to be transported, uh, people know how to cook the food and so on. So I think this slide is quite shocking, the next two slides I'm going to show. So this, this is showing you, you know, we, people are, you know, we can discuss it later because uh, people say, well, we shouldn't eat meat, right? Because meat, to get one kilo of meat, you need to give 27 kilos of grain to get one kilo of meat. We should not eat red meat, right? So, but actually, I'm an agronomist by training, so we had, you know, animal production, and there's some places that you can grow crops, and actually animals are part of the ecosystem, right? They work really well. And there are pastures, which are the, the, the areas that are more brown. This is where animals are produced, you know, I don't want to say like God intended, but basically how animals are supposed to eat. Animals are supposed to eat grass, and then they're supposed to eat us. Animals are not supposed to be eating grain to then be eating it to us, that, which is how we do it today. We put them in a, in a silo, we give them wheat, or we give them maize, 27 kilos to get one kilo of meat, and then that's how we produce. Thankfully in the UK we don't do that, but in many places of the world we actually do that. But this just shows you that there's a lot of pasture land and a lot of cropland, right? And this just gives you kind of the range. But now if I look in the cropland, so there's a lot of places where pasture is really good, where animals are really important. And animals have a really key role as well, as, for example, in sub-Saharan Africa, because animals, if you have an animal as a smallholder farmer, you have money. It's like money in the bank. You actually have a piece of money there. So if you need money, you can sell the animal, you can get money. So, you know, I just want to say that meat is not the enemy. It's how we produce certain types of meat that probably is not the best way forward. Cropland, now I'm going to just show you the cropland. And you would imagine cropland, the word crop, would imply that we grow that for crops to eat, for human to eat, right? But actually, 
look at here. This is now showing just the cropland. When it's really green, it means that that's crops that are produced for food. And when it's really purple, it means that those are crops that are made for feed, for animal feed, or for fuel to put into our tanks. This is maize, for example, in the U.S. that they use the maize to make alcohol, or sugarcane in Brazil that's also used to make alcohol for uh, for uh, fueling our cars. But it's quite striking here that you know a lot of the crops that we produce go to feed animals or go to fuel our petrol engines, and that's I think is quite shocking. So in the UK, you know we have beautiful fields of wheat all around us. How many? How, how, what percentage of that goes to feed animals? It's about 50 percent. So every other field, one of it is to make really nice bread that we all enjoy, and, and not pasta, but bread and biscuits and all of that. The other one goes to feed animals. And those animals, chickens are pretty good, but most animals are not very good at converting that grain into calories for humans. Okay? But just to give you a sense of, we still, so there's, there's a lot of mileage in doing some of these things better to actually get food in a better way to people. And don't look at this too much, but this is again, this, these are subsidies. So agriculture, I don't know how aware you are, but agriculture is very heavily subsidized. Okay? And it's really important because it's subsidized because we all like to get our carrots for 49p at Tesco. So I have my local Tesco. So I go to Tesco and I buy a kilo of carrot for 49p. And I'm almost repulsed by that. 49p for a kilo of carrot. Right? Two kilos of potatoes for a pound or something. Food is super cheap here, and we kind of gotten used to that. And then we have subsidies to help farmers make ends meet, because without it, farmers would go bust. And farmers get very little of those 47p of the carrot. So we have huge subsidies. This is in the US, OK? But the problem is that all these subsidies came about when? After World War I. Sorry, at World War II. And the subsidies came to do what? Produce meat, produce grain, and produce dairies, basically, so a lot of milk, eggs. So we needed protein to feed the world, and we needed grains. So everything was made for those purposes. But vegetables, doesn't matter, right? So why should a punnet of blueberries cost two pounds or three pounds when it's much healthier, and you can get you know, a McDonald's quarter pound or whatever for a pound 49? That's just, you know, those are things that are wrong. So there's a lot of things that are apart from production that are wrong, and I just want to kind of highlight that there are things that we're doing completely wrong. And subsidies, this in the US, just showing that in the US, there's been $253 billion done in subsidies, and only $689 million have gone to apples. And that's the only vegetable that has received a subsidy. Everything else has gone. And why? Because those, everything is made for that. The big companies are made for that. All the system is made for that. But for the other system that is perishable, it's more difficult if you can't hold the grain in their storage and so on. Okay, and then food waste is another big issue. So I don't know if you've seen the, the, the recent BBC series with uh, Prince William and David Attenborough talking about food waste. It's actually really interesting. And we all waste our food. We try to, you know, perhaps to compost and recycle as much as we can. But, you know, we don't think that this is something that is so big, but, well, you know, we, we have this at the moment. We have over 100,000 pigs that will be incinerated. They will be just killed and not produced for food. And that's just tragic when we're talking about food waste, right? So these are the things that are, are you know, really hurt when you're working on something trying to draw a solution and then for political reasons, all of a sudden now you have kind of incineration and the prime minister, sorry I get a little bit political, but doesn't want to understand the problem because it's too complicated for him, right? So, but these are things that, are, perhaps the important point is, these are things that are happening now. It's not something that happens in third world countries. It's not things that happen elsewhere. They're happening here, right? So, since I'm a geneticist, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about genetics now. And I think that then we can, we can put it in, in the context uh, in, a, in a little bit. So, when we think about genetics, uh, I'll say why we think it's important. So, so, something that has happened over the last perhaps 20 years is that there's been a big revolution in technologies. And I'm not going to argue that technology is going to make our way out of it, but I just want to argue that some of the technologies we can use can be used for our benefit. This is the price of sequencing of one human person, right? One person. This is 
you can see that the axis goes up by tens, so it's, it's, it's a really long axis, and that's 100 million US dollars to sequence one human. The first human that was sequenced cost 100 million US dollars. And then the price went down, you can see new technologies invented here in the UK dropped the price, and at the moment it's about 1,000 US dollars to sequence one genome. Okay? And that suddenly starts changing things because before we needed to and, and, and the genome basically what we get with the genome is we get the set of instructions of what makes an apple an apple a wheat plant a wheat plant and so on. And in this case you've seen that this technology now you probably now of course with COVID we've seen it now in the UK we're leaders in this technology and in the UK over 1 million COVID strains have been sequenced already with these new technologies that we have. And they are really important because within weeks or days of actually the first variant coming out, they're sequenced and then vaccines were produced. So this, 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 it's almost a miracle what science has done over the last year, I think, with the vaccines. But it's thanks to technology and the use of technology together with principles to, to deliver this. So in terms of sequencing humans, for example, we have now sequenced over 100,000 genomes here in the UK. So there's an initiative that every uh, boy or girl that's born with any condition or from parents that have any genetic condition are sequenced. They're offered the chance to be sequenced, their parents are sequenced and their uh, kind of broader family are sequenced to try to understand what are the genetic components of some of these diseases. So the UK leads in this. And because humans always come first, what's happened is that this technology has developed very fast but now we basically have the genome sequence of almost all the major crops and not just those five or six that give us most of our calories, we have crops of vegetables and bananas and so on. So now we have most of our crops sequenced. So this is the tree of life, okay? This is one, one iteration of the tree of life. So this is the birth of the earth right here and you can see here we have bacteria and all sorts of things and we're over here. That's us right there, okay? So this is basically evolution in one slide, okay? And I just wanted to show this because sometimes when we start talking about evolution, people get nervous about, especially when you're in a church, right? Oh, evolution and the church and this and that. Well, actually, you know, I always say, you know, there's no conflict between evolution and the doctrine of faith. And I think that's really important because sometimes in these settings, people say, well, you know, that, what does the church thing? Is it okay? But actually, there's no problem with this, okay? So evolution is something that is, is perfectly acceptable and it's, you know, it's not just a theory, it's actually what we know that has happened. We have too many examples to know that. But what I wanted to show you is that within each one of these little things, you know, there's variation, okay? So if you, if you see this, humans have been very good at, I'm gonna use a, a word that might sound very strong, at manipulating the genome, at manipulating, at doing genetic modifications because we've been really good at selecting variation, diversity. We love diversity. So if I asked you, you know, who thinks the word diversity is good? Most people will say, yeah, diversity is good. Who thinks that genetically modifying to generate diversity is good? Most people say, oh no, I don't want to do that. Well actually all diversity is genetic modification. It's changes in DNA and I'll show you in a minute what that means. But just to show you that, you know, we can select for dogs that have shorter legs, that have shorter tails, that have, you know, longer legs and so on. We, we've selected this and, and dogs started like this, like the husky, right? They come from wolves, humans domesticated the wolf to make the huskies and then from the huskies you have this whole variation that we have been very good at selecting. And just like we've done this with um, animals, we've also done it with our plants. This is a picture of maize and these are some of the types of maize that have been, that are currently used in Mexico which is the home of where maize was domesticated. So the original maize cob was probably about this size. You couldn't even recognize it. I'll show you a picture in a, in a, in a little bit. And then humans selected and were able to select all this different diversity, which is beautiful. So, but all of those things, all of those beautiful types of, uh, of maize, they're all mutants. They're all genetically modified, okay? And that's something that we don't think about. We look, oh, it's beautiful. Yeah, I look at that and say it's mutations, it's diversity. It's genetic modification and humans have been really good and we've survived thanks to the tradition of using that variation and selecting for it. That's what we've done over the last 7,000, 10,000 years to select all this beautiful variation. And perhaps a more extreme example is the example of our brassica crops that we so much like. So 
actually all the brassicas that I'm showing here, so the kohlrabi, sprout, cabbage, cauliflower, broccoli, and kale, they all come from a little wild mustard. It's one of those things that you pull from the garden because it's a, it's a weed, you throw it out. Well, actually some humans in China were really clever and they said, oh, let's select one that has a different type of flower. And they selected many year, generations, they selected the ones that had the bigger flower and they ended up with broccoli. Some other people in southern China said, oh, we want to select for bigger leaves. So they would say, oh, this has bigger leaves, let's keep that one and grow the seeds. Oh, this has bigger leaves. And over several generations, they produce what we know as kale. But these three, five things, they're the same. Genetically, they're the same. They have maybe one little variation, a few variations, that makes a kohlrabi into a Brussels sprout or a cabbage. They're the same species. So even things that look very different, actually, humans have been really good at changing that. that, that. So what is DNA? Okay? So DNA is basically our instruction manual. Okay? It's inside of all of us. It's inside of everything we eat. And I'm not pretending you to decode this, but just to show you that it's basically just four letters. It's pretty simple. That's what, what, what makes it complicated. It's just an A, a C, a T, and a G. These four bases that together, when combined, basically make up the genes or our proteins that make us work. It gives us the color of our hair, the color of our eyes. And then when many genes interact, how we speak, all of that is encoded in our instruction booklet. And every living being has an instruction booklet that's called, it's basically their DNA. So, just to show you how much DNA we have, how, how, you know, if we took a single cell of a wheat plant, so a cell is one of those things that you have to look in a, down a microscope, and I were to take the DNA and print it out on an A4 piece of paper in small font and print it on both sides, and then, you know, if I were to do that for one cell of a wheat DNA, I'd need 3.1 million pages to print all the DNA in one cell. So when we were trying to do genetics, we, and we didn't have this, it was pretty hard. People were saying, how are you gonna find what you wanna find if you're looking through 3.1 million pages of things that you don't even know exist? Well, we know they're there, but we don't have the sequence. We now have the sequence, so we're getting a little bit more advanced in what we can do. But just to give you a context of how much this is, if I were to take those 3.1, so since we have you know, this beautiful world here and, and the perspective, what happens if we took 3.1 pages and stacked them up? If we go to London and we put them next to the shard, they'd be actually taller than the shard. And that's inside one cell, one cell of wheat. So that's a challenge that all the people that work in the lab and that do wheat is that we need to understand what those 3.1 million pages of DNA do to hopefully be able then to make varieties that are more resistant to climate change, that can produce different types of roots, that are more resistant to the pests and pathogens, that are more nutritious when we eat them. And that's a challenge we have, okay? But it's a nice challenge to have, I think, and that's, that's what, we're, what we're trying to do. And just going back to this, this DNA, so this DNA, what will be is that it has the instructions, and just like when you get an instruction booklet from IKEA, there's some parts that are more important than others. So there's some parts here that are called genes, which are sequences, particular sequences in that, in that context that tell the plant or the human what protein to make, which means it gives them the, the, the feature to make roots that are deeper or shallower. It tells them to make, be resistant to a disease or be susceptible to that disease, okay? So these are the, the instructions themselves. And what happens in nature is that we're always mutating. Um, we want it or not, we're mutating. And that's why you say, well, you know, don't expose yourself to the sun. Why? Because you get UV rays. And when you get UV rays, what happens? Your DNA breaks. It literally breaks in half. But then we're very good at fixing ourselves and we fix it. But if you expose too much, by chance, you're going to get mutations. And that could cause skin cancer, for example. It's because UV light causes. But today, if you were a little bit in the sun, there wasn't much today, but you would have been exposed to UV, your DNA would have mutated, would have broken, and you would have repaired yourself. And this happens without you knowing, right? It's happening all the time. Our bodies are doing wonderful things. And, but sometimes when mutations, uh, when we can't repair ourselves correctly, there's mutations that appear. So perhaps five bases go missing. So now the instruction booklet gives an instruction, but it's missing a, a little piece of information. So actually that instruction is not identical to the one before. It's very similar, but it's not the same. And that might mean that the plant makes slightly deeper roots. Or maybe a single base, just one letter, can change to a T. And you can imagine as well, if you have an instruction booklet, you change one letter, you could actually change what that means. 
And the same thing here. We can change one letter and that changes the dynamic of what that means. And that can make a plant become resistant to a pest or susceptible to a pest with one change in DNA. Okay? So those things are happening all the time to us, but also all the time to plants. So I have kids, I have two kids, and they're both hybrids. They're my hybrids with my wife, and they have half my DNA, right? But they have half my DNA, but they also carry a hundred mutations with my DNA. So we pass along a hundred mutations to our kids. Thank goodness we do that. If we didn't, we'd never have evolved, right? We need to change to evolve. We cannot stay static. If we were to stay static in that tree of life, we would still be bacteria. So bacteria changed and changed and changed and like that over millions of years were us now. But we're constantly changing and passing mutations to our kids. About a hundred from both mom and from dad. In the case of the wheat plant, each seed of wheat in a spike will have, again, roughly a hundred mutations with the mother plant. If you take a wheat spike, it will have roughly 50 seeds. So each, each seed will have a hundred different mutations. If you think about all the fields of wheat in the UK, those are lots of seeds that are there. So all of them will be mutated. So all those 3.1 million bases of DNA that I told you about, those pages, they're all mutated in the UK. They're there somewhere. But if I'm a scientist and I need to find them, it's really hard to find them. How, do, how the heck do I find them, right? So, but they're there. And if that produces something that's interesting, by eye, I can select it. I, the, the breeders or the people who work on it say, ooh, that plant, all the other plants are susceptible, but that plant is resistant. I'll keep that plant, and then I'll bulk it. I'll grow it again, right? That's how it works. And that's how all those traits that you saw with the dogs, the same thing. The dogs pass mutations. The same thing that happened with maize. A maize that was a different color, ooh, this looks nice, a different color. I'll keep this seed and grow it, and then all those seeds are the same color now, and you start having this, diff this variation. But it all happens naturally all the time, and thanks to that, we are where we are today. So, what does plant breeding do? So, so perhaps a, a question first. When we talk about wheat, you see wheat fields, right? And I'm just using wheat as an example, but we normally think, you know, I, I have two brothers that, that work in other areas, and they say, well, yeah, it's just wheat, it's wheat, it's wheat. Like, no, no, it's, like, it's wheat and wheat, and it's very different wheat, no, but it's all the same. Well, actually, no, because if you're making wheat to make bread, what do you want? You want, you know, what the millers want, they want to add lots of water, sorry, lots of air, because you want big bubbles, and they want to sell you a loaf, because they sell it by volume. If you want to make biscuits, you want the wheat to get lots of water, because they're going to sell you the biscuits by weight, not by volume, right? So there's lots of different wheats, and pasta wheat is different than bread wheat and biscuit wheat. So, you know, it's really boring for you guys, but it's really fascinating for us, you can tell. But just like you have Maris Piper and Mary types of uh, potatoes and apples for cooking and all that, the same thing happens for wheat. So what does plant breeding do? It tries to find these things that are different and then tries to grow them and, and exploit them. So, one of the issues that we have, and this is where the urgency comes into, into account, it takes a long time. Okay? There's not something that we can do from one day to another. So at the John Innes, for example, we do lots of work trying to understand all those DNA bases, all those 3.1 million pages, and see which of those pages encodes for a trait that could be of interest, like higher nutritional value or having different types of grain size. And then that might take anywhere from 5 to 20 years. We work with the private industry that produces varieties, and they release different types of varieties. So every year in the UK, about 40 different types of wheat are grown in the UK. And then through that, then, those varieties are then given to farmers, and then within a year, they'll be milled, flour, and then we get our nice bread from the bread source or wherever you get your nice bread, right? So that just shows the process. So this part is one year, but this part here could take anywhere between five, usually much more, about 20, 30 years. So, we have the challenge for, 50, for 2050. That means that the varieties that will be in the field in 2035 are the ones that the breeders are crossing today. So actually, 2050 doesn't seem that far away if the things that we're doing today will be in the field in 2035 or 2040. So that's one of the things that the urgency that we, that we have. So traditional breeding is what we've used till now. The traditional breeding is what's been used over the last 120 years where we take two plants that have you know, desirable traits that are complementary. Maybe one is tall, the other one is a little bit shorter, or one has a good bread making quality, and we mix them, we cross them, and then we get a hybrid variety. And that will have the combination of the both traits. That's how we've done it so far. 
So to do this actually we take advantage of those hundred mutations that every plant has right. We take advantage of those hundred mutations. But still hundred mutations in 3.1 million pages is not that much. So in the 1920s people started using something called mutation breeding. So what they did here is that they would take seeds and actually put them in a chemical that would basically uh, like a cancer agent almost that would just make changes randomly across the genome. So instead of having a hundred mutations you get 500,000 mutations in one plant in one seed. So it's much more ok. Actually most of the organic barley that is used for organic uh, beer and so on is actually all coming from mutation breeding. So that is something that we have done for many many years but it is very much random and just almost like dropping a nuclear bomb literally use radiation to make mutations all over ok. And this are these are things that come from that like the seedless grapefruit all the grapefruits that you eat they are all coming from this mutation breeding. They all have actually been gone through a nuclear reactor to make this ok. So if you ever had a grapefruit you have had a variety that comes from that. It is perfectly safe. But just to just to give you an idea of how we generated the varieties that we have today ok. We have genetic modification. So this is GMO what we know as GMO. In this case what is done here is that you transfer a page from another species some often and then you put it into the 3.1 million pages of wheat you add one one uh, uh, leaf or so one uh, page with instructions for a certain gene that you want to transfer. So you cannot cross them naturally often you have to do some sort of manipulation ok. And then some of the traits and, and just to say that you know at the beginning we said well this is very unnatural but actually oh, you know sweet potatoes who like sweet potatoes if you have ever eaten sweet potatoes you have eaten a natural transgenic. All po sweet potatoes all sweet potatoes have genes from bacteria that have been laterally transferred. This is something that happens in nature it is rare but it happens and actually all sweet potatoes have genes that come from bacteria and this happened millions of years ago. So we you know it was not happening something that happened in agriculture now millions of years ago when sweet potato was becoming its own thing bacteria transferred some genes to it and it gave it an advantage and then all the sweet potatoes that we have now are basically natural transgenics they have a, a few genes from bacteria in them. That is how it is that is natural that is nature ok. So, some of the things that we are trying to address with this technology just to give you an idea is for example anemia. So, anemia is the issue where we have low iron in our blood and they are especially prevalent uh, in women uh, that are uh, uh, pregnant especially a problem. In the UK about 22 percent of women that are pregnant have anemia. So, one way of solving this is that all our wheat flour actually has iron. We add iron to it. So, if you look at any flour in the UK it says wheat and then we add iron that is literally pieces of iron very small pieces it is added to the flour ok. So, if you took a very, very strong magnet you would actually be able to separate the flour from the iron. So, all wheat flour has iron ok because we need to get iron into people ok that is the, the the policy at the moment. So, what we are trying to do is saying well can we make the wheat plant produce more iron ok. So, what we have done here is that we have actually taken a wheat plant and we have turned on a gene in a different way. So, in this case just to show you an example anything that is in blue is iron we stain the iron with a blue with a stain that colors it blue. So, normal iron is accumulated here and very little of it but there is very little in the white flour. So, when you have a piece of bread you have very little iron with a line that we generated for example you have a wheat grain that looks like this. So, when we stain it for iron we increase the amount of iron. So, when you get white flour you get the amount of iron that you normally need to put based on the law of the UK that we need to have 15 points per million of iron and we add it. Well, this one has it naturally. So, people say, well, why don't you eat wholemeal? Wholemeal is much better, right? Because wholemeal should have more iron and it is better. The problem is that you eat it, but all that other husk around it has other things that actually collate it, means that they bind the iron. So, you eat it and it is there, but actually, you do not digest it, it comes out the other end. So, the iron is there, but it is not useful. This iron here is useful. So, this is done with gene, gene technology, with GM, for example. This is something that has been on the news a lot recently is the purple tomatoes. And again, this idea that you know there is a, a tomato that has higher anthocyanins. In this case, it has twice the amount of blueberries. So, okay, my kids, you know, like one of them likes it, one the other doesn't like blueberries. They love tomato though. And blueberries are, as I said, two pounds, three pounds upon it. Tomatoes are really cheap. So, if people could get better nutrition through tomatoes, wouldn't that be a good thing? We can discuss it, right? But just to give you an idea that it is not all about yield and applying more chemicals and most of this you are seeing this is actually happening here in Norfolk and the tragic thing is that this the benefits are being reaped in Canada, in the US 
in other parts of the world because we can't grow these crops here. This is the case of Jonathan Jones. So he also works at, 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 the, at the institute and he took uh, at, at, uh, some potatoes from Peru. Um, but if you cross, if, you know, potatoes are very hard to cross and it'll take about 50 years to make a variety, not a ton of wheat, but 50 years. So he actually was able to insert some genes from these wild potatoes into Maris Piper. And Maris Piper, if, uh, if you have allotments and you grow potatoes, what happens? You get, you know, you get uh, phytophthora, right? you get uh, basically full of fungus. So this year was really bad, right? So we all lost our potato plants and, and, and that always happens in, in Norfolk. So what do, what do farmers do? They spray a lot. So a normal potato crop in Norfolk will have 14 sprays of chemicals. But it's great because we can go and buy them really cheap in Tesco, right? But that's how we do it today. Well, I'll tell you that one. This crop here, okay, it's a GM. It has the, well, it's a gene from potato that instead of being crossed and taken 50 years, they've introduced it. That thing is resistant. No, no, no chemicals. So it's organic. So then this, these are the false conundrums that, well, actually, I want to be more organic. I want to produce with less chemicals. Well, there, but it's GM. Oh, but I'm against GM. That's really difficult now, right? So it's not the technology, I think. It's how we use it and who uses it and who controls it. And, and we'll have a little bit of a discussion. And, and the last one, just real quickly, just to show you here. This is, we said that we need to eat more fish. And we need to eat more fish because it has those really important omega-3 and omega-6 fatty acids. But what's the problem is, how do we farm the fish? We farm the fish, but those fish that are farmed don't have omega-3, omega-6 because fish don't produce them. These little things produce them. These algae produce them. But fish who live in the ocean have eaten algae and other fish for many years and then they've accumulated that omega-3, omega-6 in their bodies. But actually if a fish is farmed, it has no nutritional quality in those fatty acids that are so important for brain development and so on. So what do we do? We catch fish from the ocean, we make it into a meal, we chop it up and we give it to the fish in the farm over the last three weeks of their life so they have a lot of omega-3, omega-6. So we feel good because we're using farm caught fish, but actually that's not very sustainable, right? So what Jonathan did is that this is a really, you know, this is really transgenic. So he took, found out all the genes of algae, about 10 genes of algae that make the fatty acids, and he put them into a crop called camelina, which is an oilseed crop. So now he has oilseed coming from a plant that has omega-3, omega-6. So instead of giving them fish meal to the fish, they're giving camelina to the fish. Okay? And those camelina will have the omega-3 and the omega-6. And then you can have farm fish, which we need, but with the omega-3, omega-6 that we also want, without having to kill more fish to give them a fish meal. So the current system is quite horrible, and these are some options of how we could do it. Okay? And the latest one that, the latest technology that we're using is something called gene editing. And you might have heard of it with the name CRISPR. Okay? And gene editing was what won the Nobel Prize a couple of years ago to two female scientists that actually were able to use a, a methodology that exists in nature, it's a way that plants and, or, or bacteria work, and they were able to simplify it. And in this case, gene editing, their specific edits are made to DNA in a very targeted manner. So instead of introducing 500,000 mutations by doing the chemical, you can actually introduce a mutation particularly in one place. And, and, and this is how it looks. This is kind of what we normally hear is called CRISPR-Cas9. And it's very complicated, but think about it like this. It has two elements. It has a Google search box, and it has a molecular scissor. That's basically what this technology is. And what it does is that in the box, I can actually get the CRISPR. I can actually put in the Google box the sequence of 20 bases where I want the scissor to go. That Google box will take it, like a GPS. The scissor will cut just like we have the cuts normally with our UV and all that, and it cuts, and then it goes away. And the plant, or the human, or whatever, will repair itself. And when it repairs itself, sometimes it makes a mistake. So the mutations that we generate by CRISPR look like this, or look like that. And then we have a problem now, because actually those mutations are indistinguishable from the ones that we produce in nature, that are happening all around us. And then that's a conundrum. Now, if that, plant is, has that mutation in nature, and we can make that also in the lab, you know, some people say, well, it's not natural. Well, actually, yeah, actually, well, the whole genome is mutated in the UK, as I told you, it's there. But we can now make it targeted. So I can make a plant that will have the same 100 mutations that will always have the plant, plus one more, in a particular place that we've targeted to. 
And these are the technologies that we can now use. And this is a technology that's very recent, okay? Just to give you an idea of, of this. So this is now coming to UK plates. So this was something that was uh, consulted through a different consultation. And now we're going to be able to grow the first experiments because what's been recognized is that if I can't tell it apart from a plant that's already in the wild, then why should I legislate it differently? It's exactly the same plant. So again, we can discuss that later. But just to give you some ideas, so the first of these degenerative crops are being now commercialized in Japan, and this is a, a, a tomato that has high GABA, which is an amino acid that's good for heart and memory and all this. Okay, so what's better, to eat the GABA like this, or to do this and eat those pills? But a lot of people take their pills to have these, all these extra things, or to eat that. Maybe you would say, well, have a more balanced diet, but actually GABA is quite difficult to get. So this is one, one, one option. And, and we do this all the time. Now, for example, we talked about fortifying iron in the wheat flour. It's just been approved recently, but now we're going to fortify flour with folic acid. So now all wheat flour will not just have iron added, but folic acid. So instead of adding it, could we actually just make the plant produce the folic acid? So those are kind of the, the questions that we're looking at. And the last example here is that, again, now because the technology, the Nobel Prize was won because they were able to make the technology that was very complicated, very simple. And that means that Basically, you don't need to be a multi-million corporation to make the technology work, like GMOs. You can actually be very small, a small farmer even. So small companies or small academics are doing this. And in this case, these cassava plants have cyanide. So if you don't cook them correctly, or if you eat too much of them, they lead to certain diseases. Well, now they've been able actually to silence the two genes that produce this. So now we have cassava that doesn't produce this. And this will go into the field to test if it works in the field, just like it works in the lab. But these are some of the new technologies that now the focus is not on applying chemicals to crops. It's about making them harder or better. Okay? So just some important aspects to consider for the discussion, perhaps. Multinationals. I think that none of us really like multinationals. And that always comes as a debate, like, oh, but the multinationals will drive this. And I think that that's where it's important that we actually say we don't want the multinationals to drive this. But it's not just in the crops where we have the multinationals. So this is the seed industry over the last 20 years, let's say. And uh, you can see here that you have the big companies like Corteva or BASF or Bayer. Some smaller ones that are owned by farmers like Lima Gran and KWS, which are different, I, I think. But basically, five or six actors control all the seed market. And people say, that's horrible. Well, but actually, I, I agree. But actually, our food industry, I showed this to my kids yesterday. I showed my nine-year-old son, and he was like, really? It's only those companies? But all these brands. Yeah, but all those brands are still those nine companies. So all our food comes from nine companies. And those companies, their interest, I don't think is to feed us very healthy. Their interest is to make profit. And that's fine, they're companies. That's their interest. But you know, there's an issue. It's not just about the seeds. These companies as well. And media industry, the same thing. We have six companies that control our information. And that's the reality. So it's not a problem just of food or the tale of the seeds. It's a problem of in a way, how we have built our society and where we put our preferences in. So again, what is natural? So again, I hope that you've seen that when we say something is natural, well, actually, all our food is unnatural if you want to look at it. This is maize, as I told you before. That's the size of a maize plant originally from Mexico. It was a little weed that thankfully had some mutations that suddenly made it a little bit bigger, and a farmer was smart enough to say, oh, I'll take the seed of this one. It looks a little bit better. I'll take it. And over several generations, they were able to move from that to that. But that's natural. So I think no one wants to go back to that, right? What about watermelon? This is the natural watermelon. It's pretty difficult. And then this. And it's quite interesting because if you look at watermelons and some of the paintings from the 1600s, you have watermelons that are kind of halfway there. They're like bigger than that. They still have a lot of white, but they're not there yet. And you can see how, how in time it's gone over there. And humans have been very good at doing that. We've done that. We've done this unnatural thing of treating this poor little plant and making it like that. Or making this maize plant do that. We've played God in a way. But if we hadn't, we wouldn't be here. So what do we do now? Do we just stop and say, no, we just need to be, let's, go, let's call this natural now. Where do we put the line? And that's a difficult part. Okay. So regulation is important. We have to be careful about over-promise and really being careful that we don't misrepresent the risk, the benefits. So none of these technologies are without a risk, but we need to kind of balance risk and benefit. Because I think that I have the, 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 the I have, well, I, I'll, I'll, I'll make the comment in a second, but there's 
who benefit is really important. Is the benefit going to shareholders or the benefit going to society? And I think that's a really important question. So just a final thought is that there are no silver bullets. There's going to be, we're going to require a lot of different people, a lot of different expertise to come together to address these, these major goals. We, in this case, for what we're doing in terms of genetics, we think that we need a proportionate risk-based. So some things are riskier than others, and we should regulate them in that manner. But not just say that all the technology is bad or good, because it doesn't work like that. It's how we use the technology. Okay? And I think that something that really struck me is, what is the cost of inaction? It's really nice to be sitting here very comfy and say, yeah, I know, we don't want any of that. But that also is an action. That also has a cost of not doing things. I think that's something we need to be aware of because it's very nice to just be comfortable and say, no, I'm afraid of this technology, I don't believe it, I'm not very sure, so better not to deal with it. We're going to say no to it. Well, there's a cost to that as well. And who suffers from that inaction? We need lots of public engagement and education about DNA and so on because that's something that we don't really have. And there's an urgency. <clears throat> the crops that are going to be in the Norfolk fields in 15 years are being done today. So if we want to get them in 2050, we you know, we can't just say, ah, in 10 years, we, we need to do it now, okay? So with that, I'll be happy to answer any questions. My email is there. I'm happy to be contacted or discussions later. So, and anyone wants the slides, I'll make them available as well. So they're all, all available. So thank you very much. Christabel, thank you so much. That was fantastic. And we're going to finish at 9 o'clock, but we've got plenty of time for questions and discussion. Um, uh, Professor, Professor Huawei has said that he's quite able to cope with comments, rants, as well as questions. But I want to urge you to think of something that at least ends with a question, so that we know when it ends. And we uh, might suggest maybe it's possible to have one supplementary to follow up if it narrows in rather than asking something completely different. And while you're thinking what you might ask, and while Matthew is getting ready with the roving microphone, I'm going to just steal the opportunity, Christabel, on the sort of Frankenstein food problem. We know that Britain wasn't keen to go ahead with that, and, and now some changes are being made. If I've understood what you're saying rightly, and I probably haven't, it sounds like you're saying, ah, oh, well, we're making edits, but they're edits that could occur naturally. We're just speeding the process up. Yes. So one thing I want to say is, doesn't it make a difference how that thing is produced? You've, you've put this CRISPR in, and that's different from the other techniques. So why doesn't that matter? And if you are able to convince people that it doesn't matter, then why restrict yourself just to naturally occurring mutations? Don't we want to let riff and, sure. and genetically engineer things that do things that wouldn't occur naturally, but we think would be quite a good idea? Those are really good questions, yeah. <laughs> so to answer the first question is that I think you understood exactly. So those mutations will happen in nature, and they're there. So that's the, that's the whole point. You know, if those two plants would be indistinguishable because when we make the edit, so let's say we have to insert the Google box in the scissor, but then by basically by growing the plant one more generation, by the loss of genetics, by the loss of Mendel, that will go away. So we can select a plant that has the edit, but doesn't have the, all the components. So we make a plant that basically, if you did the sequencing and all of that, it will be identical to the other one, but with the edit in that one place you wanted. So that's the point that you cannot tell anyone that that was done through editing or if that was done naturally because they're indistinguishable. And that's why they can't be regulated. But then if they can't, they're indistinguishable, then should you regulate them? That's, I think that's what. Then the other question about should we do things that are more dramatic? So I showed you very simple examples of like missing five bases or making a change. But the, in nature, more dramatic things happen. Sometimes you lose a whole chromosome in terms of some plants can do that. So wheat can lose a whole chromosome and the plant is still happy. Uh, so there's some very dramatic changes that happen uh, in plants all the time. Uh, we, we don't see that that much in, in, in animals, but in plants it happens a lot. So we could do things like that. I think the first step is to do things that are more targeted to say, okay, we want to then study this and see how this affects. But in a way, we just need to be, you know, as you do things that are a little bit more out there, then you need to be sure that then we have the regulation to say, okay, we need to evaluate this, and if it's behaving the way we think, then it's okay. But the point is that we don't make the mutation, we just make a cut. 
and then naturally the plant repairs itself and it sometimes fails and when it fails you get an, a mutation. So we are not introducing something that's going to make something different. We just make the cut. Just like the plant is cutting it, the UV lights are cutting everywhere, we cut just there and then just let the plant repair. So that's why this kind of first generation is one step. If you do other things like introducing DNA, then I think we all agree that then we take it on a case by case scenario, but it shouldn't be like this is bad and evil. Well, let's see what we're using it for and maybe there's some times that we want to take a risk. Well, COVID taught us that, you know, if we would have had the precautionary principle of saying, no, no, we don't know what these vaccines do, we should have been 10 years studying them. But, you know, we had a lot of information. We took a step forward because we actually needed it. I think that those decisions will become harder to do because, for example, in Australia, they were very anti-GM because they didn't see how they affected them. Suddenly there were big droughts and people said, oh my goodness, we need this. Scientists, please help us. Like, well, you told us we couldn't do this. And new varieties are coming out now that are GM and they've approved them because they are realizing that they're going to need every kit in the toolbox. And it's not that just GM is going to solve this or gene editing is going to solve it, but we can't be stifled in our imagination say, okay, we can't do that. We have to do it like the hard way. We, we're not up for that at the moment. It's too urgent to act that we need to consider all the options. And then if that's the right option, we still need to consider the social implications, how we deliver that, who benefits, all of those things still need to be considered. But at the moment, we're kind of cutting our imagination in half and saying, no, you can't do that because we're afraid of it. Why? Well, I don't know, because it's corporations. This has nothing to do with corporations. Le let's leave them out. So I think that's kind of my un initial answer to that, that comment. Thank you very much indeed um, for your wonderful presentation. I'm not a scientist, um, <clears throat> but I'm very interested in science. Um, and um, <clears throat> I'm just focusing in on this point about speed, um, because what you've described is how, um, <clears throat> excuse me, um, natural processes in effect are speeded up. Um, and um, I loved some of your slides with the watermelon kind of, you know, um, that, that took a long time to reach that point. And, and if we could, again, double it in size in, in 10 years and then double it again in one year, mm -hmm. That's kind of what we've done to the earth mm -hmm. as human beings over the last, I suppose, three or four hundred years. You know, we've kind of sped up what we do. And I'm, I'm just a tiny bit, no, I'm, I'm in, in awe of what can be done. And I dare say it probably will all happen because um, there's so much that's good about it. But I'm just a little bit, there's a bit of me that's nervous mm -hmm. that as we keep accelerating, you know, oh, 10, million, 10 billion people, no problem. You know, we can just speed everything up and do it faster. 20 billion people, 100 billion people, no problem. We can genetically modify everything. We can turn these stones into highly edible something. Um, just jo drop them in the, you know, the, the, the kind of 10th generation CRISPR machine. Um, do you see what I'm trying to say? Maybe, I mean, and some theologians have reflected um, on time, actually, and the speed that things happen and the different kinds of ways that we treat time and perhaps the need to be a bit careful about how we, how we um, how we experience time. Mm -hmm. I hope that makes sense as a question. Yeah, but no, I'm really I, grateful to you for your talk. It's brilliant. Absolutely. No, it, it makes perfect sense. And that's what I'm trying to say that I'm putting it from one point of view. But that's what I'm saying. It cannot be something that it can be imposed on people. And I think that, I think we're all very, as scientists, we're all very excited because at the moment, those big companies have only focused on these five or six crops because those are the only ones that make money. All the crops in Africa, we don't care. Let's put lots of maize, as we were talking with Nick. Let's put maize in Africa because we already have done all the maize breeding in the US. Let's stick it in Africa and hope it works. But actually, no, they don't, you know, they grow other things in Africa. Why not talk about sorghum and millets and what they actually do grow there? But the problem is that who invests in that? It's too expensive and to the research. So some of these technologies now allow us to, for the first time, approach some of these problems that before would have been too difficult. And the speed, yeah, you know, the, there, there's, again, there's other solutions to growing populations as well. You know, birth control, that's something that, you know, we, we can discuss as well. Uh, but at the same time, I think that we need, to be, we, we need to take one step at a time. But at some point, you know, some things we know that are more out there. And some things like the COVID vaccine, we pretty, you know, it wasn't that it was created in a day. There was a, a wealth of information that then allows us to say, okay, we think we can use these technologies together to do this, and we have, there's no, there is a risk. There's still a risk. You know, we don't know what's gonna happen long term with the vaccine, but based on our accumulated knowledge, we think that this is one step that we can take and we're okay. So I think with this, you know, 
you have to trust the science. And I wouldn't trust the companies, I agree. But I think with the scientists, there's a lot of scientists who want to do good for society and want to bring forward. And I think that that's where I need to get more, that's why we need to get more involved in those discussions. Because at the moment, it's just the corporations and we're kind of saying, well, we just do the science and then the companies will do it. But I think that we have solutions to offer. But we need to take one step at a time, but at the same time, we are having, you know, people are going to be suffering. And what do we do? We, if we think, you know, we honestly think that we have that some technology that can help, but it's not, it's not just alone the technology. It has to have the social component and many other things because who, okay, who are the winners? I mean, you can bring something that you think will be good. You know, we just had the example of, of a project with Graspy. And because there's been a lot of communication about this better Graspy that ha doesn't have toxics anymore, actually people already think that that's been developed. And it hasn't been developed, so they think it's okay to eat graspy now because, so there's a communication issue there. So it's, it's not just the technology, it has all these other things and the community has to come forward with it because if not, it's not about imposing a solution like that, it's about making those links and people have to be comfortable with it because it's, it's, what, it's their livelihood, it's what they eat. Oh, yeah, the uh, talk was fantastic. Um, in your view, are there any legitimate criticisms of uh, non-GM? Are there any legitimate criticisms of GMO foods? Or to put it another way, is it worth maintaining non-GMO foods alongside GMO foods? Uh, or is it just purely a uh, ethical debate? No, I mean, you would always keep, you would always have, um, so for example, if you make a GMO, you have to introduce that gene to a variety that actually exists, like Maris Piper. So the varieties will still exist, will still be bred conventionally, and some of them will be tried to improve because there are some things that are just too challenging. The question will be there and then, well, should we then not just, just not grow potatoes then? We have this problem of, of Phytophthora. Should we just not grow potatoes? Or we apply 14 chemicals, or we say, let's give up, let's not grow potatoes. Or we try to find, it's really difficult because in a perfect world, you say, well, this crop is not really well for this place because we have this pathogen that always kills the crop. Let's not play chemicals. Let's grow something else. But we still have people that need to eat potatoes. You know, how, how, how do we do it? And then I think that's, that's the tricky part, that it's not a black and white thing. And we, we're trying to find middle grounds with things that we think are of relevance that can have an impact to try to reduce the environmental footprint. But the GMOs or the gene editing will always exist within the context of that traditional breeding because it's like having the best radio in the world, but if you don't have a car to put the radio in, then you can have the best radio, but it's not gonna work very well. So you actually need to have the chassis, you need to have the varieties that are done conventionally that are keep, on, are keep going, but in some cases, we can do gene editing on them, or we can try, try to improve them for particular purposes, but it won't be a separation of the two systems. So the things will still continue working together. That's how we envisage it. Thanks. Um, I, uh, I, I, my natural hunch is to think that gene editing and, uh, and genetic modification has enormous potential. Um, uh, but I, I, and I occasionally get into discussions with people who uh, think it doesn't have potential and it's very dangerous. And uh, I, uh, I don't have anything much better than my hunch to go on. Hearing your talk and other things I've read or heard similar, you know, confirm my hunch that, uh, that there's enormous potential in this. But I wonder uh, whether you have any examples that I could use when I'm in discussion of uh, where a genetic modification has enabled um, a, a chemical or a pesticide not to be needed anymore. Because in most cases, I think, the people who are very anti-genetic modification are also very anti the use of chemicals in agriculture. And, uh, and, and my argument is that uh, actually this is the way to get rid of chemicals it's not, uh, you know, so there's an awful lot of good in it, but I don't actually have any real life examples that I can quote to them. I think that the, I think people are quite shocked when you hear that potatoes are sprayed 14 times a year, bananas are sprayed, I think, three times a week. So our nice lovely bananas that we eat, they're sprayed three times a week so they don't get a disease called black cigatoga disease. All bananas that we eat are Cavendish, they're all a clone, they're all identical replicates of themselves. 
So it's like, if we had to go back and draw the boards again, we'd do things differently, but that's where we are today. We have one banana, that's the same banana that everyone eats, it's one clone. It's susceptible to this disease, so what do we do? We spray lots of chemical to it to try to get bananas at 19p or 15p that banana. But I think the potatoes are a really good example because I think that we've all grown potatoes, we've all seen what the blight does to our potatoes, and the only way to grow them is to spray 14 chemicals. You could argue, well, if you we do rotations and all that, to a point, I think, to a point. But I think the potatoes is the, is the best example that, that I can give you of some a technology that I honestly believe could have a huge impact in reducing our chemical use, which is what we all want. The problem was that when GM was introduced, it was driven by those big companies that said, oh, I'll sell you the seed and I'm gonna sell you the chemical. So those seeds were resistant to the chemical. So those chemicals killed everything that was green except your plant. So that was the original GMO that the company said because they said, well, I'll sell you with this hand, I'll sell you with this hand, and I'll make lots of money. And that's why that's a problem, and I completely agree. But the whole point of these GMOs that I'm trying to show is basically an example where we don't apply chemical. The current situation is that we apply 14 times. This situation, we don't apply. And then that presents a dilemma because then, you know, even if you have some doubts about it, what do you do? You don't grow potatoes? Well, option one. So everything has a cost of inaction. That's my point. If we, we, we say, oh, I don't want GM. Okay, you're then saying that it's fine to apply 14 chemicals a year to all the potato fields in Norfolk and around, right? Or you have this technology that we need to test it. And we test it in the field. Jonathan has tested the field and it works in the field. But actually, it's now being used in the fields of Idaho, of the US and Canada because we can't grow it here. So it's having the footprint, it's having the benefit, but not here. So that's what I'm saying, it's in a case by case scenario. We cannot say that GM is good every time and that who controls it, who benefits from it and for what use. Those questions need to be part of the discussion because if not, it's very black and white and I don't like that because, but I think that's a good example and I can give you more information if you want because that usually, you know, we've had chats with Natalie Bennett and the Green Party, it's been great to discuss how we do things and the allotments, yeah, our potatoes, yeah. Well, what if you don't need to apply chemicals and, you know, and, and I think that having those dialogues are really important because then people see, well, actually, I'd like to test, I'd like to try that, right? And, and I think that that's where, if any GM will be approved in the UK at some point, I think that's the one that will be the most charismatic for people to realize that this is not trying to make money of selling you chemicals. It's the other way around. It's to avoid the company selling you chemicals and make an organic potato with good yield, because we need to have the yield, we need to have the potatoes we're able to eat, or we make the prices go up. And then all of a sudden, we start having the problem that only the people, we still have nine out of 30 kids who go hungry to bed every day in the UK. And that's a problem. We need to find that balance. It's not a black and white answer. And I think that that's where I'm trying to show the nuances to say there are still some solutions that we need to test them at least and see if they work. And that, that's what I'm trying to, to, to convey today. And we need to be careful with the speed. We need to have those. But if we, if we just are traditional and say, well, let's not do anything, we're going to hit a big wall and people will, people are suffering already. Not here maybe, but people are suffering already. And it's going to get worse. It's not going to get better. And that's where, where we, we need to start at some point. Um, first of all, can I thank you for being such a, um, a lively and eloquent communicator. I really appreciate it. Um, I want to ask a question about the scientific mindset. Um, I know that if I become deeply involved in a task, I get deeply involved and I need to take time to step back to see the flaws in what I've done. And I'm, I'm sure I'm not unique in that. I'm sure scientists get deeply, deeply involved in their narrow field. Um, so what I want to ask is, to what extent do you and your colleagues feel that you are your own ethicists um, and your own health and safety officers? Or are you mainly reliant on outside agencies asking ethical health and safety questions? So that's a, that's a really good point because we think, as I said at the beginning, I think we all have the best intentions, but sometimes we don't know those unintended consequences. Uh, and I think that's where 
at the moment now, we much, we're looking much more to partner with other people. So for example, uh, we now started partnering with UEA and the Social Science Department and their International Development Department to start thinking about these because they ask questions that we've never thought about. <laughs> like, have you thought about this? Like, that's a good question. Actually, we haven't. Okay, and, and to start early because currently what happens is that people develop a solution in Norfolk and then we say, oh, now we can then transplant this to Ethiopia uh, with very little local partnership and so on. I think that has been a, a model that's happened too often. I think that now it's much more trying to start from the beginning having those conversations about what is needed and so on. It's difficult because we speak different languages, right? We, we speak very different and we, as you say, we normally think about technically how to do this, but are you actually asking the right question or is that the right you know, way of solving that, that issue? And I think that that's happened now over the last 10 years. I've seen a dramatic change in terms of that dialogue, but we need more of it. And, and as I said, I think that the, the idea of who benefits is something that we haven't thought about. We just thought about let's solve it rather than saying, okay, who's going to benefit? How are they going to benefit? And that's something that's really changed in the funding structure. So a lot of the funding opportunities now require us to actually include people who think very differently from us. And it's difficult at start, but it, it's, it's helped. We're not there yet, I would say. We still need a long way to go. But these examples are good examples of where we need to work and, and understand better. But it's, it's definitely 100% required. Because we have for, let's say, until five years ago, I think everyone was very much about the problem. And I think that now as we think about, okay, now we need to translate that potential solution to a farm. Now, okay, how do we do that? And that conversation should start actually earlier rather than at that point. But it's, it's, it's happening now, it's much more fluid now, but we need to do better, yeah, I agree. Uh, you can't go crops without water and uh, one of the obvious consequences of climate change is that a, a lot of regions in the world are, are going to be um, drought stricken in, in one way or another. Um, what, can, can you give us some examples of different uh, responses to that in different parts of the world, be it to irrigation or genetic modification or, or whatever you want? Yeah. Those are tricky problems. Um, there's a couple of problems that are quite tricky. Nitrogen is a, or fertilizer is a, is a big problem. We apply for every kilo of fertilizer that we apply to crops because we have to apply chemicals. I mean, chemical fertilizer, 50% goes, goes, goes to waste, actually goes into the water streams, right? Um, so plants are not that efficient at doing that and we apply lots of nitrogen. Um, water is a big issue as well. And again, companies try to sell this water guard and all of this, but it's, it's, it's tricky because it's not one gene that will be a silver bullet. It's going to require a mixture, for example. So what they've done a lot in South America is they've done direct drilling. Uh, so they will harvest their wheat and then instead of removing all the cover that, that remains, they'll spread it out and then they'll drill directly into that. So they conserve the water of the soil. So not everything will have to be with genetics. I think that's important to say as well. So it's not like this because I think water it's something that probably will need to be deeper roots, but also conserving water in the soil as much as possible. And that means having less runoff, so having soils that have cover crops and things like that. So I think it's going to be a more integrated solution for those type of problems. But at some point, it's going to be that we cannot grow certain crops in certain regions. And that's going to have huge implications, as you were saying, about social, about culture, you know, Olives, for example, in southern Spain, get, it's going to get to a point that they're not going to be able to grow olives between the Tsailela, the new disease that's there, the Pierce disease, and water. And then water between the city and the crops, there's going to be decision making there. So, but those are not very simple solutions. And, and as, as I, at least from my experience, there are very few examples of something that's really dramatic. There's slight change of 10% better water use efficiency. In Argentina, they've done that, uh, academics have done that for. Um, sunflower and for wheat, they're 10% more efficient with their water use. 10% is one step, but it's probably we need more than that. Um, so it, that it, is, it, is, it is a worry. It is a worry. And that's where you say, should we be growing crops for animal feed? Or should we be growing crops for some animal feed, like the camelina, that makes sense because then we're not getting fish from the ocean to make them into meal. But then, so that's where the balance of animal protein and plant protein and 
those are conversations. I think that that's more a solution rather than trying to engineer a crop that will be super water because I, I don't think it's going to be that easy. That's a problem that's much more tricky to, to do. We already have a lot of problems with pathogens and other things that we can, we have a, a glimpse of what we can do, but those other things are still a little bit away. They're still a little bit science fiction, I would say. Uh, and we have other ways perhaps to address them that might be more immediate, uh, but they're uncomfortable. People like to eat their hamburger for a pound 50 or whatever at McDonald's. So it's going to need pol you know, policies to change, unfortunately. Another problem is making sure the farmers get the right kind of advice and grow the right kind of crops in the right kind of physical circumstances. Um, a case in, a case in point, uh, about 20 years ago, I was looking at traditional agriculture in southwestern Turkey. And I think it must have been in the 60s or 70s, the agricultural extension officers persuaded them to grow government wheat. Uh, I can't remember what, it, what sort it was directly, but they called it government wheat instead of their traditional wheat. And it didn't go down very well. The yields weren't as good. Um, there's a problem with harvesting because a lot of it was still being done by hand using sickles. And this wheat was close to the ground, so they had to use machinery to harvest it. They didn't have the machinery. It had to come in from outside. Uh, and it was expensive. I mean, they had to use extra fertilizers as well. So they weren't terribly thrilled by this. And I think the fault was really with the extension officers that they themselves do not understand the real basis of the science and how it had to adopt to the particular ecological conditions in specific areas. I think that's exactly the point that, that you are making in the back as well about is, there's other social, you know, it has to make, in India it has to make good chapati or else people will not grow it. You have to be able to harvest it with the waste. If they don't have access to the machinery then it's of no use to have a wheat that they can harvest with their traditional method. So, but those, those things need to be taken into account 100%. Again, ex the problem is that extension agencies, the UK had a great extension agency system, now it's all now private and you have big agronomy companies that actually farm most of the farms in the UK. And that's happening in many other parts because it's become this massive commodity in terms of just producing, producing, producing and you know, keeping soils fertile. That's something that if you rent a farm, you just go in do whatever you need and get out. And more and more, the farmers who actually farm the land are saying, well, we actually need to keep the soil so it has enough nutrients and organic matter and all of that. So we, I think we're going to need to go to more a regenerative system of agriculture. That means that you actually think about cycles rather than just about the crop. But with the system we have now, where most farmers are just you know, kind of tenants who go in and crop and then get out, that's a problem because they're just thinking about like companies make the money and get out. And then that actually is not good for our long-term things. And that's where some of the new rules that are coming in are thinking about the environmental services of agriculture, which are really interesting, but at the same time, we still need to produce food. And the balance, perhaps, farmers are feeling that it's gone too far to produce environmental services. So they're gonna get subsidies based on environmental services rather than in production. And that's a very big shift that's happening now uh, in the new subsidies that we have in the UK. And it's going to be a balance now how, how that's going to work. But actually, you know, the Jeremy Clarkson, I don't know if you've seen that, but the Jeremy Clarkson is a really interesting, you know, I, I've never watched Top Gear, but with my son we watched the Jeremy Clarkson series of farming. And it's really interesting because he actually puts it in very simple words and farmers are really happy with it because it's really difficult to be a farmer, to make ends meet and to make all this. But, you know, at some point the system has to put more money into it, but how do we do it? And, 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 and it, is, it, is a, it is a huge challenge, especially when most people don't want to farm. <laughs> most people, most kids want to get out of there and, and go to the city as well. And that's not just here, but everywhere. Yes, thank you very much for your interesting talk. One of the things I'm impressed by the globe is how much salt water there is on the earth. And I wonder how much effort goes into developing plants that can use salt water, not to distill it or anything, but uh, we know we can uh, eat seaweed and kelp and things like that, but uh, what, what kind of a challenge would it be to develop any kind of food plant that can grow in salt water or use salt water? I think one of the, the tricky things of that is that 
<clears throat> there are some plants that are able to live in a very saline environment and, 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 and because of kind of the pressures of too much salt and how the water flows, they can actually do it. But the problem is if you use salt water on the soil, the soil then becomes too salty at some point. So there are some plants that are adapted to that, but if you actually put more salt on top of it, uh, then that becomes a problem. I think that, that, that's the issue, that the, the salt, the plants don't take up the salt, so the salt stays on the ground. So they can take up the water, but then after a few years, the ground is so salty that then it's too much. Kind of uh, the, the, the balances of you know, the, the water, the water doesn't want to leave the salt, it stays in the salt because it, it's just too difficult to get it out of there. So that, that, I think that's the problem of using salt water currently uh, in agriculture, and that's why they have to do, especially in, in, in Israel, I think they're, the, they're leading in terms of using that type of system of kind of getting salt water, purifying it, and then using it for a lot of their hydroponics or their kind of, you know, closed environment systems where they irrigate very precisely and so on. But I don't know if anyone is actually doing, using salt water because of the buildup that you get of salt in the soil. So thank you again, everyone, for coming. Shall we give Cristobal one more round of applause? <laughs> I've been tremendously stimulated. I hope that you are. I hope you'll be thinking, and perhaps if that's your thing, praying about how we are going to go forward. And we've got two more talks booked. Uh, they're not on exactly the same day. Uh, it's Tuesday next week. We've got Merit Shrozhev talking about the world's oceans and climate change. A blue planet, blue god. It does look very blue and we've mentioned the oceans. And then uh, the following week, I think it's on the Monday, uh, we have a talk on managing the conflict that may well result from all of the challenges that will arise as the climate changes. Uh, so you can find information about that at the back. You can find information about that on Science Faith Norfolk's website and on our Facebook page. Did I mention I've got a wonderful secretary in Science Faith Norfolk? Professor Bruin has got a sign-up sheet. So if you'd like to receive our emails, one way you can do that is by signing uh, Nick's sign-up sheets. I can see they're being waved at the back. It's fantastic of you to be here and there's no charge but if you would like to make a donation all of this this wonderful architecture you see it doesn't just build or maintain itself I can see the vicar agreeing with me uh, so if you are able to make a donation towards the cost of the exhibition the speakers and uh, the maintenance of this wonderful edifice in the heart of the city then that would be fantastic I believe they even have uh, the machines that can take your card as well. That, that's true, isn't it? Yeah, this vicar is on top of the game. So uh, please give yourselves a round of applause and Christabel one more time and have a very good night, safe journey back home. <laughs>